While stored, the wine will then undergo alcoholic fermentation. This occurs either naturally or through the addition of selected yeasts to the vat. Alcoholic fermentation is the process. Welcome everybody, welcome. Welcome. Yeah, so that was just a, a little bit of a taste of, uh, you know, how, how champagne is made. Step one, create wine. You know, I think it's crazy. I had been drinking wine for a very long time at the very beginning. I think it was like uh, probably like six years into drinking wine. And then I realized uh, just through reading, it was like, huh, they have to make a base wine first and then they make it bubbly. And it made it sense why it costs just a little bit more than just regular wine. Yeah, it was fascinating. Yes. Yeah, there's it's it's an engineering feat. There's a lot more steps. There's a lot more effort, um, and uh, at least with champagne, there's a lot more regulation too. You... There's a lot more time and space that's required for it, and we're gonna we're gonna be talking about eh, some of those things. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome everybody. Great yes. to see you. Um, we've made everyone a panelist. That means that you can share your video and audio. We ask that everyone stay muted for the first portion of the event while we um, go through a number of topics. A number of topics. And then we'll open things up at the end for a group discussion. So our, uh, our overall agenda for the day is we're going to be spark talking about sparkling production pretty quickly. We're going to kind of gloss over that. It's a very detailed and in-depth um, field. Uh, we just, we're going to get onto the good stuff. Uh, feel free to open up your bubbles now, uh, but we will get into the tasting of the rosé first. And then we will go through all of the Cremant regions and a little factoid about each one of them and just uh, cool, neat little factoids. I love factoids. I think that they're so fun to just have like this uh, working knowledge of what they are. Uh, and then we're going to go into the tasting of Alsace and then just kind of look at bubbles from around the world because that's where it all started a couple started. years ago. The, the bubbles, bubbles from, from around, around the world. The world. <laughs> Yeah, what a great lecture that was. Well, we're still going to have a great one tonight. And so, oh, and at the very end, stay tuned. Uh, we're going to talk about what we're doing in 2021 that's going to be super awesome and uh, unique. So let's move on. Uh, so like I was saying, you start with a base wine. Uh, everything's kind of revolved around this idea of batonnage. And that's where you take the still wine and you let the, ye the lees, which is the dead yeast, sit in the wine. And that produces this autolytic effects. That's the, the flavors and phenolics that are uh, geared towards what, like hazelnut. Ready notes. Ready notes, croissant. Notes, nutty notes, like you said. Hazelnut. Yeah, a lot of times, you know, when we talk about barrel aging red wines, we want new French oak or new American oak, and that imparts the tannins into the wine. In this point, they're not really trying to get tannin structure from the, um, from the barrel into the still wine. Uh, so Chardonnay would have barrel influences through malolactic fermentation, and that's not really sought after with champagne and other sparklings because we want to keep that acidity level high, and that makes, uh, yeah, so acidity level high, bubble structure very fine. That's kind of the overall goal that every sparkling wine producer is going for. And so this batonnage allows the lees to sit uh, in that still wine. Because our still wine, we want to be neutral. We want to have this fresh sense of, of place, but then the lees allow for um, this very delicate essence to be imparted in the wine. Um, and we, they stick a plunger down into the wine and stir it around. Uh, if you don't do that, uh, it gets pretty gross pretty quick. So uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful picture of, they took uh, one of the barrel sides off and put a glass piece in there and then also a light on the other side so that way we can see in there while they stir the still wine and you see the lees break up and make it cloudy and really kind of impart those their all their goodness even though they're dead they still you know break down enzymatically uh the wine all right so uh the traditional wine method uh is is this wine folly produces a a great uh you know series of articles yeah great resource so we were talking about the cuvee that's the creation of the still wine at the start and then what we do is we add more yeast and some sugar to it and then we put like a, a screw cap on and then we let it sit for a while uh, and then we slowly do what's called riddling to get all of that yeast sediment into the top and then we crack it open 
and we inject some like some dosage. So it's a little bit of sugar uh, is going back into it. And then what they'll also do is they'll take a bottle of wine, crack it open, and then funnel back into the top any kind of volume. Yeah, yeah very little, a little bit, bit. Uh, to make sure that every bottle is is full. Uh, and then it's... no dosage is becoming very trendy these days, though. Yeah. So I. Oh no. Oh, hold on. No, 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 no. No, no. All right, one second. Technical difficulty. Do, 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 do. All right, hold on. Up a little bit? Down a little bit. Oh, okay. Well, we'll do it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Sorry. Ah. Uh, you know. Because I can see everything, and that's not a clickable That's not a clickable page over there. All right. So I'm going to show this video real quick. It's a... Uh, a quick, I think, two-minute video. Yeah, so everybody, please feel free to drink. Um, I will narrate over the top of it um, while they're going through this. I think I can actually mute. Yeah, I can mute this. So here we have the bottles, and they're, they're tilted completely upside down, and they're actually freezing the top of them. Uh, and it makes this ice plug. And then we go into the disgorging process afterwards. So we're going to pop that cap off. All the yeast is going to be attached to the very top of that cap. And there's so much pressure on the inside because we've had the, the yeast and the sugars doing a second fermentation process that creates the bubbles on the inside. And that bubble is just so intense and has nowhere else to go because the cap is on there that we, uh, the CO2 infuses into the wine. And that's why, you know, I poured this glass uh, quite a couple minutes ago and I still have bubbles in it, right? It's because it's infused into the liquor, uh, into the liquor. The cure. Uh, so here we have the uh, uh, the added sugar as they're topping it back off. Sorry. The dosage. The dosage. That's what it is. Yes. All righty. Fun fact: It used to be that champagne, and well, it really was mostly champagne, was uh, many, many, many decades centuries ago was very very sweet and it's just been trending more and more as time goes on towards dry so now we have very very dry champagne is very popular dry styles of sparkling wine are very popular but there's um, a fun discovery where they found some champagne that had been preserved through uh, lost to time and they found it again and it was very very sweet so it used to be the taste to have a lot of dos a lot of sugar added at the dosage step but no longer is that the case yeah and so here we're, we're finishing it up with the putting the cork on in the cage and then the foil at the very end. Oh, they do mix it one last time. And so this is all being automated. So before each bottle used to be done by hand um, and some places still still do that. Mm -hmm. uh, the other very popular method of creating sparkles in your wine is the tank method. And it's a little bit easier to do because you put the still wine in a tank, you add the sugar, you add the yeast, you keep the pressure tight on it. So that way, again, we have that CO2 infusing into the still wine and then it gets filtered. You have the dosage and then bottling. Uh, so this is really uh, specific for Prosecco is the most popular of the tank method. You typically won't get as high of a pressure inside of the bottle just because of the way the, the method is um, just because of the way that it is. Uh, if you would like to learn more, uh, please check out Wine Folly. It's a great resource. Uh, there's a lot of terms, and once you learn the terms, everything makes a little bit more sense. And so you can keep going, kind of going back to it, maybe come back to this lecture next year, and then eventually all the terms will make sense, and they'll all fit together, and you will be a wine expert. So. Do we have a few more people to add? To oh, let's areas? check real quick to see if we have more people to add before we get into our tasting portion. We Is everyone do... able to see the map okay? If you can see it okay and you nod, I'll be able to see you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Good, good call to make sure that everybody's in before we get into our very first tasting. So, yes. Yeah, so... Um, Cremant. I guess we should explain what Cremant is versus Champagne, first let's, of all. Let's do that. So everybody here, pro like, I think most people by now, has heard somebody say, Champagne only comes from Champagne, France. Everything else is not Champagne. You're not allowed to say that. Uh, of course, uh, I always strive to make sure that distinction is met. But, you know, I still call it a Xerox when you make a copy of something. <laughs> Band-Aids. There's a lot of examples of this. <laughs> exactly. When you have that much marketing be thrown at something, uh, you know, it sticks. But so Cremant is wine 
in France, made in sparkling, in the traditional method. And so that's the champagne method. That was what we just saw in that video, um, where we have second fermentation that happens inside of the bottle. It is the creme de la creme of wine, sparkling wine production. So we are going to go through, at a moderate pace, all of the Cremant regions and kind of say a little something about them. And we're going to keep going back to this map. And so that way you can kind of get a sense of place where this exists within France. So we're going to start with Cremant de Lemoux. I added some phonetic pronunciations this time. Hopefully that'll help. There were a lot of new French words for those who either are trying to brush up on their French or are not familiar with French. So Lemoux. Exactly. So I think I'm going to wait till I click next slide and then I'm going to read the phonetics. So that way I don't uh, make it sound bad. <laughs> Cremant de Limoux. All right. So would you like to share about Limoux? Sure. So um, Cremant de Limoux um, is actually arguably the f where the first sparkling wine was noted. This is in 1531. Um, a lot of Places will claim that they were the first to make sparkling wine, though. So really, it depends who you ask. So even if you ask the English, they'll say they created it first. If you ask others, they might say it's champagne. A lot of people have heard of Dom Perignon. He, he forwarded a lot of advances in champagne um, and in the making of champagne, but um, arguably um, the first... Uh, recordings of the, the, that style of sparkling wine came from here, Cremont de Limoux. Um, the grapes that you'll find in here are different from the grapes that are going to be in Champagne, and that's something you'll see throughout as we go around and we go through all the regions of Cremont. Um, the grapes are going to be specific to the region. So here, our primary grapes are Chardonnay and Chenin Blanc, um, but others that you'll find are Mosaic and Pinot Noir. And you can also keep your eyes peeled for a special wine from Limoux called Blanquette de Limoux. And it's a traditional style sparkling wine, but it's made out of 90% Mosaic, the local grape. That's pretty cool. Uh, so we're going to get into our first tasting, which is uh, from Limoux. This is a picture of the, the chateau. I think they're called chateaus. This is big buildings. Uh, so this does have Chardonnay, Chenin Blanc, and Pinot Noir on there. Uh, so the Pinot Noir is going to be pressed off in a manner so that way this will have a little bit of that red color. Um, obviously with Chardonnay and Chenin Blanc, those are white skinned grapes with white juice on the inside, so we would not get that rosé color. All right. And, and a lovely color it is. It is a lovely <laughs> color, indeed. So we're going to play our little game for everybody that is new. Oh, we're going to check to make sure that we have... One more panelist. More panelists. All right. Perfect. All right, everybody's welcome. Welcome. So welcome. We see lots of webcams on, which we love. That is fantastic. <laughs> so what we're going to try to do here is to test your senses. So we've put everything into two categories. One is, uh, if, give me a thumbs up if you get this strawberry, pear, lemon, maybe a little bit of uh, stone fruit, like a peach or a nectarine, and then also give me a peace sign if you have more of these autolytic notes, the the bread and the hazelnut. Uh, and then more apple versus pear. And it's possible you get both, which you're also welcome to show a sign for the audience that you get both. So I, see, I like. see some who get both. I see some P signs. Yeah, just give that a little a thumbs up. All right. All right. All right. So, so, we get, so it's a mix and you, you know, tasting is, is a more art than science. It really <laughs> is. And so, obviously, like, they want to have these autolytic notes. That is really sought after. But for me personally, I'm up here. I'm getting... Uh, really, that lemon comes through mm -hmm. with that pear. The, the strawberry is a little bit more subtle. And then the stone fruit is even more subtle. And I would actually say that it's uh, uh, not necessarily, like, a super fresh peach. It's more of, like, a, like a muddled... Slightly kind of... underripe. Yeah, under yeah. Underripe. Yeah. So... That's what we get, but obviously with the tasting, it's entirely up to your senses and your experiences. It so. can be the glassware you're drinking it out of, which we're going to talk about. It can be true. the environment that you're in. It can be what you're pairing it with, and all those things are going to play a role in what you taste. You know, we opened another uh, a bottle that was Pinot Noir heavy from Champagne the other day, and 
Beth drank it out of the universal glass and I drank it out of a burgundy glass. So the burgundy glass is a little bit bigger base yeah. and then the nose at the top is, is about the same size. And we swapped glasses and you really could pick up different essences on the aroma. Uh, mine had a lot more of that cherry coming through and yours had more of those autolytic notes that are really wonderful that we come out of. So even that, the glassware between bigger glasses can play a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So. On to the next region. All right. So now we are going to go to Cremont de Bordeaux. So yes, I, many people may have heard the word Bordeaux. It's like Bordeaux, Cremont de Bordeaux. So here, this is a much more rare bottle. Um, you're unlikely to come across it, honestly, in the States at all. Um, sparkling wine production in Bordeaux is low because they really are prioritizing their still red wines, which are some of them go for some of the highest price tags in the world. Um, sparkling wine production here, though, has been going on for over 100 years. Um, interestingly, though, it, the Cremont de Bordeaux Appalachian wasn't announced until 1990. Um, here we have a mix of reds and whites that can go in again. So the reds are the ones you might expect from the region if you're familiar with Bordeaux. So Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet, Malbec, Petit Bordeaux. And what's interesting is in the side on the whites, you actually see Sauvignon Blanc as well as Sauvignon and Muscadel. And Sauvignon Blanc is not typically used in sparklings, but here in Bordeaux, it can be occasionally. Occasionally, yeah. I think one of the only places that really does Sauvignon Blanc in bubbles would be New Zealand. Yes. And that's because New Zealand has, uh, that's their workhorse down there. All right. Our so, first fun fact. Fun fact. <laughs> Factoids, if you will. Uh, under pressure under pressure so <laughs> so a tire pressure on your car has about 30 to 50 psi uh but your champagne bottle has 70 to 90. crazy almost double to triple the amount of your car tire that's a good way to think about it um the punt that you'll notice at the very bottom i mean there's a picture of it there but i'll show you in real life too uh that's actually designed to help with the pressure while it's sitting in the caves uh, so that way the bottom doesn't burst out. If it was a flat surface and you have an increased pressure in the bottom, it will blow out the bottom. Um, cellar accidents are pretty, uh, they're still common, like they still happen Happened. today. Yeah. There are cellar death accidents as well, but we're not going to talk about that too much. That was more uh, in the past. That was more in the past. Uh, and because also, well, here's a little tip. If you're ever trying to get a bottle of champagne op or sparkling champagne, whatever, and it's not coming out, the, the cork's not coming out, if you tap on it with a like a ring or a, like a watch or a something, metal object. a metal object, it creates this increased pressure from agitating the bubbles on the inside and the cork will almost fly out on its own. <laughs> and I say that because one bubble, one bottle bursting is not going to hurt somebody, but an entire cellar bursting can be really bad because it, it sets off this chain reaction. Or yes. It can. All right, so now we are going to go up north to Loire. Cremont de Loire. So um, here's some images of uh, the Loire Valley. There's some grapes and castles. Loire is wonderful. It's just full of beautiful castles and chateaux. Um, amazing. Why is it? that there's so many chateaus in Loire. Money! That's where the moneyed <laughs> aristocracy were during at least a couple of periods mm. of, of France history. So you have these really um, fairy tale looking castles. So there's one there. There's also a limestone cove shown here. So this is where the, you can see some of the wine aging there on riddling racks. Um, when we think about Cremel de Loire, um, the primary grapes here are going to be Chenin Blanc, Cabernet Franc, and Pinot Noir. You can also have a number of others present. But one of the things that's interesting about Cremont de Loire is that you won't see Sauvignon Blanc in their sparkling, even though um, Loire is a beacon for Sauvignon Blanc around the world. It's one of the, the, the famous places for it, and it's grown a lot. Um, they do not use it in their sparkling. So Yeah. yeah. All right, so now we saw a picture of a riddling rack, and we talked about it briefly at the very beginning. Um, and so this is a picture of one, and it's just a, a wooden A-frame with slots on it so that the 
bottles can sit inside of it. And somebody would go around and slowly rotate the bottles so that way the yeast uh, kind of unclings from the side of the bottle. Yes, this is done by hand. By there are hand. miles and miles of these tunnels. People would ride around on bicycles and go through and do this job. Right. And so for very long-term storage, it would sit on racks and you don't need to riddle them when they're sitting flat. They just exist. But once you're about to start this process of getting the yeast into the neck of the bottle, you start at the bottom of the riddling rack and it's a little bit uh, more slanted than flat and you rotate it and then it unclings the yeast from the side of the bottle and then you slowly start moving it up the riddling rack. And as it moves up the riddling rack, the angle of the bottle increases, which forces that sediment from the dead yeast, the lees, into the neck of the bottle. And then it will rest there and be ready to be disgorged. So uh, that is a labor intensive process. So a lot of people now have where you load all of your bottles into these machines and the machines agitate them and slowly tilt them into the orientation so that way you have the collection of the, the lees into the neck of the bottle getting ready for disgorgement. Yes, and so um, hand riddling, uh, being that a human has to do this and it's a bit time consuming, is done typically for more um, prestigious bottles, um, more pricier bottles. Um, a lot of Cremant is going to be riddled this way by this type of machine. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we're moving on. We're coming back across France. We're, we're just going to start down in the in the southwest now and then we're going to go you know up the up the eastern side. Oh, did I say southwest? Southeast. So we did we did uh, we're going all over the place. Just follow the arrows. <laughs> so now we're heading to the Cremant. The D. The D. Um, spelled die in English, but D uh, in French. So uh, here, the primary grape is Claret. It's a, a, a local grape. Um, other grapes that can be present are Muscat Blanc à Petit Grain and or Aligoté. Um, one of the interesting things about Cremont de D is that um, they also claim that they are the first to create sparkling wine. There's a local legend that a shepherd left a wine bottle in the river Drome, um, and that's a picture of the Drome River there, and um, forgot about it at, over the winter, and it was very cold, so this stopped um, fermentation, and then in the spring, he happened upon it again, and it was sparkling, and so this is the their little local legend. Um, How they had the claim to fame of the sparkling. The first sparkling. So now we're going to talk about serving temperature. So you want to serve champagne cool, or, and sparkling wine uh, cooler than most other wines, uh, but not too cold. You really don't want to be pulling it out of your refrigerator. Your fr refrigerator is, what, what is a refrigerator? Is it in the negative? I don't really know. Low. No, low, low. But it's typically below five degrees. 30s? And also the, <laughs> the cheaper the wine is, the bubbles are, um, the cooler you want it to, to be. Or and conversely, you could think of it, the, the more high quality it is, the warmer you want it to be. The reason for that being... Is that you're going to want to get those the phenolic essences coming out. Whenever you have a warmer wine, it will um, give you more of the phenolics coming out of the glass, which is a more pleasant experience. So for a $100 bottle of champagne, you don't want to miss all these wonderful aromas that you would be getting. If it's too cold, you won't get as much. Um, however, if it's too warm, there are a number of issues, which we will talk about later. <laughs> so I think at this point in time, we should also talk about service. So when you have a dinner party and you are serving people wine, you go around and you can top them off, right? So that way, you know, if, if server's coming around, they might not be there when they run out of, you know, if they were to just drink the whole glass through. Um, so a server will come by and top you off. They top offs. Top offs. They should not top off your champagne. And that is because the bubbles, right? If you keep adding it, your bubble structure will kind of collapse more in the glass. So you drink one glass the whole way through and then you pour yourself a second glass because the bubble structure is actually really uh, staying intact inside of the bottle, whereas it would fall apart outside. Um, it's analogous to coffee. So it, uh, a nice hot, 
hot cup of coffee, you pour yourself one. You don't necessarily want to keep topping off that lukewarm coffee. You want to wait, finish it, and give yourself another nice hot cup of coffee. And so we can really try to figure out when we have our first sip of a glass of wine versus the last sip. Um, and so a lot of the times I know that I'm very critical of my very first and second sip of, of a glass of wine. And then I start just kind of getting into the vibe, the, the feeling around me and, and the atmosphere. But so on your very last sip, also kind of take a note, you know, can you pick up those more autolytic notes? Has it become a little bit breadier and yeastier? And then when you add your next glass, do you get that fresh fruit coming back into your, into your palate? Something to think about while you're drinking. All right. So, Cremant de Savoie. Cremant de Savoie. So, um, this is actually the newest Cremant appellation. They officially were announced in 2015. Um, we had the pleasure of drinking a bottle from this region that wasn't specifically labeled as a Cremant, but um, had the grapes in question, and it was delightful. So, the, these grapes are local to Savoie, and the primary grapes are going to be Jacquer and Altesse. Um, they'll also possibly have Chardonnay, Chasselas, and Aligoté. Um, and so this is an image of some Jacquer grapes, and the Savoie region in France um, has some really beautiful mountains, which are pictured here as well. Yeah, they're really close to the Alps, right? So, in the, the Swiss border. All right, so... Beth Let's found get this. Nerdy. <laughs> Beth found this, and I think it's just super cool. So, so yes. So, do you, I mean, do you want to go know? for it? Okay. So this is um this this is a scientific study regarding um the the way to pour your sparkling wine so that you do not lose the CO two. So what we're looking at here are um they developed a special infrared imaging technique to observe the CO2 um, during the pouring process. Um, what, they, what these researchers did is they um, served champagne, in fact, in this paper, um, at different serving temperatures and either in the traditional rest, like the, the way you would serve champagne at a restaurant, um, and that's the upright pouring directly in, or um, to serve it in the beer style where you um, angle the glass and as, as it gets more fully lifted up. Um, and what you can see here, um, the pink is the background and the green and blue is the CO2. Um, on the left side are colder temperatures and on the right are warmer temperatures and then um, you have the different styles. So what you're observing here basically is that if you're pouring for yourself at home, I recommend pouring in the beer style, and I recommend pouring well chilled. And this way you'll preserve the CO2 as much as possible. But what a fun um, <laughs> job to uh, study champagne pouring. I feel like those grad students must be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't. I, when you found that, I was just like, ah, oh, that, that takes the cake for me. That's the coolest, that's the coolest slide. One of, it has to be one of the coolest. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to head up north to the Cremant de jo uh, Jura. Jura. Yeah, Jura. Jura. Not Jura. 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 Oh, shall yeah, I go? Okay, so sure. Cremant de Jura. So here um, we are looking at Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Poussard, Sauvignon, Pinot Gris, Poussard, and Trousseau. Um, it's one of the more there's, rare Cremants. Yeah, there's not really a lot of information in. about this one. Um, <laughs> I haven't had the chance to try it myself yet. But, but really, it's the grilled notes on this wine that is what you'd be looking for, as well as having this really rich floral side-by-side. -side. And I think that is uh, that is Jura. And there's some images here of beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah, you can kind of see this uh, this rocky landscape and really more tougher terrain to kind of farm on. All right. Okay. So by the same researchers in a different paper, they looked at glassware. So I mentioned we would talk about glassware, and I feel like this is a good opportunity to talk about it in general. Um, a lot of times people ask, what should we be serving sparkling in? And or they don't ask, and they serve it in a coupe, and that is the uh, least preferred. <laughs> so 
Sparkling wine um, can be served in flutes, tulip glasses. Um, we're actually drinking it out of a universal glass. It can be served in burgundy glasses, and it can be served in coupes. There really isn't a wrong answer, but if you're looking for a certain experience, you want to choose your glass accordingly. So we choose the universal glass, um, or you could choose a white wine glass because we want to get more of the aromas, but we still want to trap a lot of the bubbles. Um, the thing about flutes is they will preserve the bubbles, but they will not necessarily allow you to partake of those aromas. Um, and so if you're drinking an expensive champagne or a cremant you really love, um, you're going to maybe potentially miss out on some of the experience in flutes in terms of the aromas, you'll still get the delightful sparkle and you'll still get the flavor profile, absolutely. Um, they're also really fun. We love drinking things out of flutes too. I'm not I'm not hating on flutes, right. but tulip glasses have been a favorite as well because they allow for more aromas to be captured, um, but still preserving bubbles. Um, uh, champagne that is um, heavily uh, Pinot Noir, um, from major houses. They often will serve in burgundy glasses. Um, nowadays, that's very trendy. And the coupe glass is just kind of like fun and says party. So, okay, anyway, back to the <laughs> science. So here we're again looking at this special infrared technique they developed where the background is pink, the CO2 is in the dark blue or green. And what they're showing here is that you really lose a lot of the CO2 um, when you serve it in the coupe, which is the B. B is the coupe glass and A is the flute. And so, um, again, I believe they're looking at different temperatures and different glassware here. So colder is better, flute is better if your only goal is to preserve CO2. But as I just mentioned, there's more going on. <laughs> Sorry, we just had an ambulance go by. <laughs> um, I think it is important, though, to also you know make a comment because in the scientific world, we don't want to be changing too many variables. And when we do change variables, uh, we want to identify them. So this is the restaurant pouring method where you have your glass down and then you you mm -hmm. pour, not the, not the tilted method. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think also I want to talk about kind of your atmosphere, too, yeah. right? If you have a very nice glass of bubbles and you're sitting at home and you're enjoying it and you have... The, the frame to sit there and appreciate it, then having the universal glass is really nice because it... Or a white wine glass. Or a white wine glass. Because you want to have a bigger bowl because the surface area allows for the aromas to come out. And then when it comes together at the top, it traps it. You know, where all the aromas are going to get stuck in here. And so you can stick your nose into it and pull all those aromas out. The, the coupe glass just doesn't really have that because it's so wide, even once you drink it down a little bit, there's nothing to trap it in. It's just going to, all the aromas are going to escape out. Um, also, I hate the coupe glass on New Year's Eve. I don't know why they do this. If you have- The, the tower. Well, the tower is cute, but if you're walking <laughs> through a crowded like New Year's Eve event mm. and you have, I've, I don't think I've ever had a sip of, of champagne, only the very, very end of it because I just get knocked around and it spills everywhere, which is one of the benefits of having the flute glass because mm -hmm. the flute glass mm -hmm. can, because you have that very narrow opening at the top and people don't fill it all the way up. You're not supposed to. It's only supposed to be halfway to three quarters of the way full. You have some room to get jostled around and, and beat up on New Year's Eve <laughs> and still have have your champagne to drink so any bars out there if you're doing new year's eve toasts well you know well we're not gonna talk about that but <laughs> so okay all right on to the next one right okay so cremant de bourgogne very good yeah. cremant de bourgogne. Um, so actually i do want to talk before we before we move on to this slide i kind of want to talk about the the region of cremant de bourgogne because we have two separate and distinct regions. We have the northern part and the southern part. Actually, I do think it's, yeah, no, it is illustrated better in this one. So we have the dark purple at the very top, and that is like your Chablis region. And then we have a southern part as well. In the southern part, we're gonna get a lot more of the fruit essences coming through. And in the northern part, it's so close to champagne that we look for a lot of those champagne characteristics. Some say that if you get this, uh, so this label, I've been trying to figure out where Wine Folly found it. Uh, I haven't seen it on a bottle and I would keep your eyes out to see if you can find it because then we have a control of the aging uh, length for this Cremant. 
Uh, and so you look for eminent, and they have different stages of it. So your grand eminent is going to be aged for a very long time. Only the best grapes are gonna go into this, the first press grapes. Are, you're gonna have the best of the best. And it's gonna be a lot cheaper than the same care that goes into a bottle of champagne. Now that's not to say that you can't find champagne that's cheaper than a grand eminent. It's just that something that's been aged for 36 months prior to it being, uh, you know, finish its production, it's going to cost a lot more coming out of champagne than uh, Bourgogne. Yeah. Um, Cremant is required to be aged at least nine months before release. Um, but some regions, um, some specific subregions do require even more time. Um, some require 12 yep. months before release. And so it is, you know, good to note that uh, where Champagne is on this big journey of a map. Even though we're not really talking about Champagne today, it's still good to know in reference where we are. Um, so we're just going to blow right past that. It's extremely far north. I mean, it that's the only thing true. I would add. It's one of the most northern places that we're that we're seeing grape growing, grapes growing. Um, you know, that sometimes might strike you as sort of strange to think about. But um, if you look at a map again and you look at the, the, the you've traced the lines across, I mean, France is much farther north than where we are now. Um, it really is. I mean, until until sparkling wine was coming out of England, which is becoming a thing, um, it really was one of the, the farthest north that was a major wine producing region. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to talk about Cremont de Luxembourg. Uh, so this is actually in Germany, not in France. All the other ones are located in France. And so I guess the cool story about this, I mean, other than just really a beautiful city, gorgeous architecture and vineyards you know, surrounding it on this river. The interesting thing about it was that it was discovered or kind of created uh, to get around taxes. So Germany used to have a huge tax on France for importing bubbles. And so uh, they created a bubble producing Mecca in Luxembourg to get around taxes. And then they could just sell them as a in, in country product. Uh, fascinating. And so it's still considered a cremant to this day. Alrighty, so we are going to get prepared for our next tasting and I will show you how to properly open bubbles. There will be a demonstration now. <laughs> Yay! Alright, so you want to remove the foil, right? Uh, if you are sabering a bottle, you want to make sure to get all of the foil off because the foil can actually hold some of your shards of glass and um, you and do not it, want to drink shards of glass. No, no. Uh, and when you do saber a bottle, uh, what will happen is uh, all of the glass that does break from the sabering process goes flying off into the distance. So if you have that foil there, it can get trapped in there, and then you have to use a coffee filter and pour your your champagne through the coffee filter. And, and I, at least that was our my solution. Anyways, okay. So moving on. So we have the cage, and the cage is is twist tied on after you remove the foil. And so, for me personally, I always remove the cage. You do not have to remove the cage. You're not supposed to, right? You don't, you don't have to. You can if you want to. So you loosen the cage and you keep your hand on the top because you don't know if this thing is going to blow. I think I just have big hands. I think that's really what it is. Yes, yeah, so you do not want to point the bottle at anyone after you have loosened the cage. Um, bottles have been known to just, just release yeah. the cork. <laughs> and, and it can release the cork while the cage is still on there because it's just loose. So you want to get the cage out of the way. Um, you'll notice that there are you know, two rings. On. Two rings. There's an upper part where the cap used to be for when they were, uh, before they disgorged it. If you are going to saber a bottle and you want to do it more properly, you can tighten the cage on the uppermost part of the, the lip. And that will help kind of keep the cork on the glass. So that way it doesn't like prematurely shoot off before you've, clearly sabered and then that way you get that awesome feeling so this is proper opening as well as all of the savoring tips that i learned over the summer <laughs> don't forget the seam if we're going to talk about well savoring... i guess we might as well so if you look <laughs> on your bottle you'll notice that there is a seam and so that is the line that you want to take with whatever object you're doing to hit the glass bottle and then have it shoot off um, it is not a sharp object you don't want to be savoring with the sharp side of a knife you want to be using the back side the blunt side um, also watches or even 
you know, wine, the edge bottles of, the of glass, glass. Uh, um, are significant enough because you just want to induce uh, like blunt trauma to the tip of the bottle, and then it will shatter and shoot off. And so you're you're clipping with your blunt force that uppermost part or the lower part um, to create the trauma. All right, so what you can do here? We're not savoring tonight. We're not savoring tonight. <laughs> No. Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to hold tight to just the cork and the cage, present your bottle, and then you're going to twist just the bottle back and forth until you can feel it start to loosen in your hand. So right now I can feel the pressure building up and I could just let it go and you slowly let it, let it escape. Now, when you do this, it should sound like a, the sigh of a contented woman. So here, we got, we got an ASMR here. Let's see if Something like that. A gentle hiss. A gentle hiss. All right. All right. Here, here she is. Yeah. So that is how you properly take off uh, champagne. Or, uh, yeah. It's just cremant bubbles in general. But you are also welcome to let it go pop because you know, that is a lot of fun, too. <laughs> it really is. We always sit there and we get it to that point where you're holding the pressure in and then we look at each other. And we may let the other person decide. We say party or pro. And then they get to decide. If they say pro, we try to make it sound as light as possible. If they say party, you let it go out a little bit more. And then you push pressure into the bottle, back into the cork, and then let it go. And it shoots off and <laughs> makes a wonderful sound and really gets you in the mood to enjoy. Alrighty. So I am going to pour for you. I was hoping that you're done. I actually didn't see that. I was hoping. I, well, I am done. Oh, yes. good, good, good. Uh, but yeah, so that that's the restaurant style. So as and now he's doing the the beer style. So the beer style will preserve more of the bubbles. Yes. All right. Oops. We'll get to that in a second. All right. So I hope you guys enjoyed the live presentation of how to properly open a bottle of bubbles. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well. So um, our last scientific article of the night, um, some of you maybe have heard of this. It, it made a big splash when it first came out. But for those of you who haven't, um, a researcher in Champaign um, did a series of, of um, calculations to figure out how many bubbles are in your glass of champagne. Um, again, this is actually specifically champagne, but it should work for any sparkling, including Cremel. Uh, any traditional method, sparkling, uh, and he determined that if you're serving at the proper temperature for champagne and you serve properly, you would have one million bubbles in your glass. But what's especially fun about this article is if you really dive into it, you get our favorite answer at the patent office, which is... Um, it depends. <laughs> so there's a lot of parameters that go into how many bubbles. There's the glass shape. There's the temperature. There's all kinds of things. So um, the answer is really it depends. But a million to, to a couple million is probably a good estimate. <laughs> yeah. All right. And now we're moving on to our very last cremants of the evening, the cremant d'Alsace. So we have a bottle of that with us today, and I hope whoever's you know opened both of them. Uh, congratulations! Rock on! Rock on! <laughs> we opened both too. <laughs> so we do want to bring up uh, oh, you know yes preservation methods. preservation methods because when you open up a bottle of, of sparkling wine, it feels like a bigger commitment because you are committing to drinking that whole bottle because you know that it won't stay overnight. Um, at least when you open a bottle of red or a bottle of white. You tell yourself that you could save a glass for tomorrow. Now, whether or not you do is entirely up to you. Uh, and they have pressure mechanisms that help conserve that. Vacuum uh, in. Vacuum one. In. Yeah. Um, there's Coravins and things, too, that you never even open it. But but they have champagne stoppers. Now, uh, you know, you can get them from everywhere. We picked up ours that has Wine Folly on it because I use so much of her resources that, you know, if she has a, a branded one, I, I hope that she... They, well, and they selected a good brand. And to they go with. did select a good one. And so when it goes on the top, it's very easy. It just pops on, and then you you clip the bottom part in. And so as the pressure is released from the the bubbles on the inside, it actually creates a more tighter seal at the very top. If you use any of the other vacuum pump downs, they either don't fit in correctly, or as the pressure on the inside increases, the seal itself. Um, 
isn't sealing correctly and you have this escape of the bubbles and uh, then you just they have... fly off oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if you've ever tried to stop up bubbles and let them go uh you'll find sometimes they uh it, when you look at the bottle in the morning in your fridge there is uh, no more stopper on it <laughs> <laughs> all right so moving on to our next tasting we're going to go back to that thumbs or peace sign and uh you know i hope that people are drinking this this evening and you know thank you so much for for listening to our lecture so far we still have a couple more slides after this but uh <laughs> cheers 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 <laughs> totally different totally totally different wonderful wonderful grapes um mm -hmm. so what do you guys think do we have those lemons and pears with stone fruits or do we have more of these autolytic notes coming through that honey and that <laughs> i mean i'm getting some honey i'm getting some honey on this now there is pear and there is a little bit mm -hmm, of this mm -hmm. crispness to it that so I, really there's there's something to be said for for both of them and uh that's why i throw these up there this is more of of how how you best get the senses right i do get a little bit of of lemon in this but for me that honey comes through in a very large way um i that fascinated yeah um okay is there a question down there do we have a question okay um i see bread we have a, a bread note yes i think i'm getting um a sort of bready toasty yes. note uh, aroma of bread and taste of apple. All right. Very good. Yeah. Okay. I think those are. The, I think that's perfect. Um, and again, while we do these, you know, kind of chats, I think that would it, it would really be helpful if you type in. We'll do that in the future. Yeah. We'll do our little guessing game. But if you really get like an an essence of what you what you think is coming through on the wine, feel free to yeah. type it into the chat. Yeah. It's really cool. And we'll also have an opportunity to talk about it after we go through a few more slides because we yeah. have a lot of slides tonight. Thank you for, you know, enjoy <laughs> hopefully you're enjoying. <laughs> well, and so always at this time, you know, I really, this is, we put this bottle second and we went on the tour all around Cremont, you know, starting with Limou and ending in Alsace um, because this wine really is special. And so I really like to end with pretty, pretty pictures. Uh, just to kind of give us a sense of place. 50% of the cremants that are produced um, come from Alsace. So if out of all of the cremant regions that we've had or talked about this evening, Alsace kind of feels a little bit more familiar, it's because it is. I mean, I can't imagine what this would feel like to live there, where literally your entire town is surrounded by vineyards and then you just have mountains in the distance like that just seems awesome uh it must just be like a, a different way of life where so many people work in the vineyards and so many people um just drink wine on a more regular basis here you know when we talk about and we're studying wine and everything we really in america we talk about well, there's so many beer drinkers, right? And, and gaining this appreciation for wine. And it's fascinating because you can't just give somebody the end product and have them love wine as much as somebody who grew up in this town. I think that's kind of a thing that I'm coming to, to realize um, is that, you know, kids growing up here probably walked up the side of these mountains and, and looked at these views their whole lives. Like just seeing the, the grapevines you know, growing and the leaves flapping in the wind with the sun beating down. You know, it, it would it's just very be a romantic image. Yeah, mind. just a very different uh, perception about wine. Um, so. Ooh, I did want to add. Oh, I'm going to go back to the nope. picture. Then. Oh, oh, yes. Go back. So I don't know if you do, you um, have decided to do any pairings this evening, mm. but uh, we decided to pair our creme with um, Cheeto popcorn um because all things cheesy and creamy and and rich kind of foods go really well with these high acidity traditional method sparklers so um that's going very well <laughs> <laughs> 
So especially if you have like a, a more bitter wine, I, I kind of detected in our rosé that we had this mm -hmm. evening, there was a little bit more bitterness than we get in our second one. Our second mm -hmm. one is very creamy from Alsace. Um, the one from Limou had a little bit of bitterness, but when we paired it with food, it really cuts, helps balance that out mm -hmm. and make it a wonderful experience. The food helps improve the wine. And I think that's something that we need to consider when we're purchasing as consumers is that we don't always need to spend the most money. You can you can get some cheese or you can do a proper pairing and really bring out a great experience because that's really what we want at the end of the day. We don't want to just spend a lot of money. We have, want to have great experiences. <laughs> and so, um, yeah. Also, I think it, you know, I, I wrote it and it's hard writing the pairing notes uh, and saying like French fries and oh, fried yeah. chicken, like fried greasy fatty things are amazing for bubbles, pork chops, like, mm -hmm. but it really is. It's true, and not just pork chops, like the the schnitzel, the breaded pork chop. Bre yes, yeah. Um, really goes well because you're going to get those bread essences from the fried, greasy notes, and it's going to help bring out those autolytic notes from the wine. Because once you have the bready uh, fried chicken, it's going to kind of help bring out that that secondary and tertiary flavor of the wine a little bit more. And plus, also you just have this high acid wine that helps cut through that fat like a saber, really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, cool. All righty. So now we're gonna move on to the, the bubbles around the world part. And so these are the bubbles that have just a clear cut name. And it is important to know that when we say cava, all cava comes from Spain. When we say champagne, it comes from one specific region in France. When we say Cremant, it's not all France, but pretty close. <laughs> they all have a root to it. Um, Sect is the bubble name coming out of Germany. And now Sect is actually going to be made in your tank method most of the time. Uh, Sect isn't typically exported, uh, although we are seeing it more just because German wine is getting so good. Uh, some say because of climate, climate change. change but uh, they do have a, a Windsor Sect that has... Uh, a lot more care that goes into it, more aging, made in the traditional method. Um, I've personally never seen that on a bottle, but if you do see that, again, homework, take a picture, send it to me. I'd love to see it. Uh, invite me over even. That'd probably be a better <laughs> way. All right, so then when we get to Italy, in the northwest, we have uh, Asti, which is in the Piedmont region, and then in the northeast, we have Prosecco. Oh, we love Prosecco. Do you love Prosecco? If you are going to spend under $15, for wine, cava and prosecco really are the biggest bang for your buck. Absolutely, yes. Oh, and, and as we bring up price point, I guess um, to just to mention when it comes to Cremant, um, if you are looking in the ten to twenty dollar range for Cremant, you're going to get very good. You're going to get good Cremant. Um, if you look in the twenty to thirty dollar range, you'll get excellent Cremant. So um, Cremant, you're probably shooting ten to twenty dollars um, typically. Yeah. And again, like there are going to be different producers making different products. There could be very very um, lovely Cremant, but they they do have to compete uh, on the world market, and the prices are usually a little bit better. Um, Prosecco and Cava, as Stephen said, are, are really great bangs for your buck as well. Champagne, um, I mean, the sky's the limit yeah. there. So <laughs> You typically won't find a champagne less than 25 20 at the absolute most. And if you are finding champagne for $20, like you should start to kind of wonder what's going on with this. Did somebody get a good deal? Has it been sitting like in a warehouse for a while and they just need to move inventory? If that's the case, roll the dice. Maybe it's great, uh, but typically speaking, you're going to be looking for 25, 35, and up. Uh, and then, yes, the sky is the absolute limit. Uh, typically speaking, if we are going to be drinking, uh, you know, that sixty dollar price point, it's going to be bubbles from champagne. Mm -hmm. uh, a grower champagne. If you're talking about a prestige cuvee, you're looking at a hundred to two hundred dollars. Yep. All right. And so now we're going to move to. South America, and we have Cap Classique. South Africa. From South Africa. Also, yeah. this is just a great map, too. I, yeah. I love the wine belt uh, because it really shows the growing regions where we find wine in the world. Uh, outside of that, it's either too hot, too cold. Uh, and then we also have to have sun conditions and water conditions that are conducive for growing grapes. So, you know, we really can't have wine outside of these regions. Um, 
you know, we do see that the 27 on the lower hemisphere, I think I want, I want to bring this point up, nothing to do with sparkling, just a cool factoid, uh, is that when we're over in Argentina, there's the, uh, the mountains, the Andes, right? Andes Mountains coming down, and then they, they are terraced coming down into Argentina from Chile. And so we have such high elevation, and we can get really close to this 27 uh, latitude line. And uh, it's still cold enough because we have such high elevation that wine can still grow there and make really interesting stuff. So anyways, that's why it's 27 in the southern hemisphere, 28 in the no northern. It's because of that, like, I think it's because of that one region. Well, I mean, English sparkling might change things soon, too. That's very true. So as we have the Atlantic current that comes up across Europe that uh, allows for all of this wine production region to exist... As we have climate change, we're starting to now see uh, champagne or in champagne style sparkling wine being grown in England, and it's really prestigious and nice. So we will be talking about that in upcoming lectures. For yes, sure. well, and the one of the interesting things about English sparkling wine and why it's really coming on the map is it is the same limestone chalk vein. The Cliffs of Dover, it's the same limestone chalk vein that runs from Champagne all the way up through England. So we're talking about the same soils. So they're growing sh the, the same grapes. They're going to Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and they're getting great results now. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the temperatures are just allowing for it. It wasn't true a while ago, but now, great things, yeah. And then our last formal lecture slide is, uh, is the United States. Where are we growing sparkling wine that is really taking the stage and uh, worth talking about? Now, there are other places as well. New, York, uh, New Mexico has uh, an interesting project, but they're more one-offs. Like one person is doing an Virginia. amazing thing. Yeah. Virginia has some really interesting, uh, pretty, very, it's, I think it's really great yeah, we've bubbles been coming out of it. Yeah, we Virginia sparkling. Uh, but we really typically are seeing better success and quality coming out of Long Island. The Finger Lakes in New York, Willamette Valley, and then of course California, just because it is uh, our, you know, Green Valley where all wine can be grown because they have just perfect climates, uh, elevation. So we have the colder elevations in California that allow for the high acidity to produce these wonderful bubbles. And every kind of soil type you can imagine. So Pinot Noir and Chardonnay being grown there, mm -hmm. of course, someone immediately thought, well, let's make some bubbles. <laughs> Everybody sees what uh, champagne's being able to charge for, for high quality bubbles and they're like, let's see if it works here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you everybody for, for staying so long. I uh, wanted to give a quick little, you know, what are we doing in 2021 uh, to make, make it a little bit more special. Uh, one of kind of the campaigns that I thought about doing was a full lecture series. So each one of these lectures, we're gonna have one a month there's going to be a blog post that kind of highlights not only the specific wines, the regions, the terroir, but also some type of wine production um, or historical note that's important for the wine. And that's going to be put into a module. And you can read the notes uh, on the blog post. You can watch the video. And then there's a quiz at the end of it because, you know, you guys might be missing quizzes in your life. <laughs> and now's the time uh, to really get into it. And at the end of the year, at the end of 2021, Anybody who gets uh, eight quizzes passed, then I'm going to send you a pin. It's going to be a, one of those little enamel pins for the Veni Vini Amici 2021 pin. Uh, potentially a, a bottle of bubbles to celebrate with. I got to talk to some people first, though, so don't quote me on that one. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's just a, I'm hoping that it's a fun way to engage with everybody here to around the, the topic of wine. Uh, as we move forward, we're still going to be setting up stuff for you guys to be able to have the wine shipped directly to you. But please don't feel pressured to buy that wine. You can have, you know, go pick up a similar bottle from your own store. Honestly, I would love to hear your tasting notes about a wine that's similar uh, to what we're drinking, as well as the differences, right? Especially if it's that quality wine, that over 15 over $20 price point. Um, because we want to be able to detect what's the similarities between these wines, even though they're grown by different producers. So, and then our upcoming save the dates on, for those who are in Alexandria on the 16th. So next week, next week, next yes. week, please sign up soon. They, they are hounding me 
Uh, how many people should we expect? This is all small business people. We are we have uh, two cupcakes coming from Lavender Moon and two uh, special curated glasses of dessert wine. And we will be doing a dessert lecture on that. And then uh, New Year's Eve toast on December 31st. And that's just going to be a very casual hangout. We're not going to be really lecturing about too much. I mean, we probably will lecture a little bit, but not too much and just kind of hang out. If you have like a, a video of you performing your you know whatever hobby if you play a musical instrument if you please send that to me i'd love to kind of make a little show and tell if we could uh and then after that we have a meet the producer event on my birthday i mean january 12th uh we are going to be meeting speaking of sparkling wine from the finger lakes uh dr frank uh out of the finger lakes is a great vineyard if you go there if you if you sign up for this event uh we have discounted packages that you guys can purchase uh get shipped to your door and then that is actually going to be the setup for the January lecture. We're going to be talking a little bit about Phloxfera, and that's going to be the focus of January. And so how does Dr. Frank up in the, you know, Finger Lakes play into that conversation? Stay tuned and, yeah. uh, and you'll find out. So for everybody that is tuned into YouTube, uh, please like and subscribe. I have to say that. I'm pretty sure I have to say that. Uh, <laughs> but for everyone on the WebEx, if you hang tight, we're going to um, end recording and open up for discussion. Hopefully we can hear your thoughts on the wine and um, answer any questions and talk about mutual enjoyment of bubbles. Yes. All right. So feel free to... All right. Yeah. So we are. Do we? Can, are we? We're just here. Yeah. Yeah. This is just. <laughs> that's just for us. Cool. Hello, everybody. So yes. Um. So this is the discussion part. Feel free to unmute yourself and. Um. We'd love. Oh, wait, to here. Can we get everybody to smile and cheers real quick? Uh, I'm gonna for, take a screenshot if you don't mind. <laughs> all right. Cheers. <laughs> I always end up putting. All right. I think we're good. Are we sharing? Are we sharing our video? <laughs> Oh, yeah, no. We okay, we got to do that. All right. Um, but yeah, what did you what did you all think? Did you like it? Do you, what are, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah. I enjoyed both, but I think I like the second one better. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Second one's good. Second one's real good. <laughs> I have a question for you guys about the term brute. Okay. Is that a regional thing or is that just any generic sparkling? Oh, all right. So that is a, that's a sparkling good term. To answer your question, the short answer is it's a sparkling term. The long answer is there are different levels of sweetness. And I think Stephen is uh, sharing a link. Oh, I'm unable to send a link. Well, you're in the Q&A. You want to be in the chat? How do I get into chat? Uh, the bottom right. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. It's over here. There's All the right. chat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> technical difficulties. Um, so Stephen's attempting to try to send you a link but, but there's can, more information can... about sweetness. So Brute is a sweetness level. Um, there are a series of sweetness levels that have developed over time. And as I mentioned earlier in the lecture, um, they've really developed because tastes have changed. It used to be preferred that sparkling wine was very, very sweet. So we were talking about du or um, demi-sec. Demi um, and then they developed more and more terms as time went on um, to to reflect drier and drier um, Well, and even, of even inside of that, we have... Oh, no, hold on. Um, <laughs> Our camera ran out what? of battery. I think we could just use this camera if you want to. All right, hold on one sec. <laughs> uh, but no, we do have also a situation where um, even once they defined like a low sugar amount, because palates kept getting wanting drier and drier and drier wine, uh, they kept adding on more and more drier yes, restrictions. Yes, like dry, extra dry, brut, uh, brut nature, um, and then um, now you might see zero dosage. Yeah. So um, the interesting thing about sweetness in wine too is you're less likely to taste the sugar because of how um, 